Hi everybody, we have a special episode of Talk Gnosis coming up for you today. Uh, we have some news about the Gospel of Jesus' Wife fragment, uh, and, and a lot of interesting developments have happened in that story. So stick around for this Talk Gnosis special report. Hi everybody, Father Tony Sylvia here, and Jonathan Stewart is joining me to talk about this interesting development. Hello, Jonathan. So uh, the Atlantic Magazine put out a, a couple of interesting stories over the past couple of days, one Wednesday and one yesterday, um, regarding this Gospel of Jesus' wife fragment. Uh, Jonathan, you were the one who brought this to my attention. Can you give us kind of a rundown of the, uh, the basics of the, the first story? Um, but for the overview, do you want the overview of the Gospel of Jesus' wife? Oh, yeah, you're right. Let's start, on this. That's a good idea. Let's start there. Previously covered on Talk Gnosis, we will also link that as well. But um, uh, Dr. Karen King, uh, who uh, of course is a, a genius and a, a giant in her field, um, was uh, the, someone contacted her with a credit card size piece of papyrus fragment. Uh, it's uh, it's um, not in very good shape, but you can make out a few sentences. One of them's something like, should have done research before doing this show. Mm. Uh, it says something like, on one side, it's, uh, you, you know, Jesus says, my wife. Yes. And then on the back, it says, uh, she is worthy of being my disciple. Yes, uh, plus some interesting uh, things that seem to be copied directly from the Gospel of Thomas, um, yes. but also but copied in a very interesting way from the Gospel of Thomas, and, uh, as described in this article. Yes. Uh, so we've known this for a while. Almost right away, people were saying that this is this is a forgery. It, it's a little bit too convenient um, to find a scrap that just has Jesus saying "my wife," and also <laughs> it's a little bit more convenient to have um, just on the back the "she's worthy of being my disciple." Um, so right away, that that raised some red flags. Uh, further testing did discover that the papyrus is uh, genuinely old. Yeah. So, um, so that was uh, a big red herring. Uh, but of course, uh, you can actually buy papyrus that doesn't have writing on it. You can purchase it through the antiquities market, right? Uh, through the black market, and sometimes on eBay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, apparently, the ink also checked out. But yep. the uh, I'm not a I, you know I'm not an expert. I'm not an expert in anything. Come to think of it, <laughs> but the uh, uh, but there's uh, there's ways of faking that as well. So right, right my away. understanding about that is the ink is made with um, period accurate materials, but anybody can yes. find a recipe for that online, and there's no way to specifically date the ink itself. Precisely, yeah. precisely. Uh, so, so right away, that all you know. So there's some red flags, and you have this conflicting information. But um, uh, right away, right away, people were suspicious because of the content of the fragment. Mm -hmm. But then I, I think about a year later, some some scholars noticed. That the Coptic, the uh, the language to, that this was written in, seems to to borrow quite specifically from the Gospel of Thomas, uh, and, and then, a specific version of the Gospel of Thomas that has a typo that is apparently only available online, on, on a website. So that's that was another kind of nail in the coffin, as it were. Yes. So uh, I would say maybe for oh, at least a year now, up until let's say last September. September. You know, last September there was a symposium in uh, in Toronto on Christian Apotheca mm -hmm. um, with uh, Dr. Tony Burke uh, heading something that he organizes, uh, who of course has been on the show. Mm -hmm. And they, they basically did a round table and they, they had some really, you know, um, real amazing scholars kind of have a symposium and a talk about this fragment, including Dr. Bart Ehrman. And they basically came to the conclusion that, that this was a, uh, a forgery. So. The idea that this is a forgery isn't new, but this new Atlantic article really kind of puts the, the nails in the coffin, as you said before. Yeah, so the, the article itself is just fascinating. It's, a, it's a, um, an investigation of the, the provenance, and I'm, I'm not going to say it in a fancy French way because I'm a <laughs> dirty American, but the provenance of this document, um, where, you know, like where it came from and, and who owned it and all of that, so that the the gist of the story, and I do encourage you to read it for yourself because it is super interesting. In fact, I'm going to read you the, um, the, the little snippet that they have under the, under the headline because it's very interesting. 
Um, a hotly contested, supposedly ancient manuscript suggests Christ was married, but believing its origin story, a real-life Da Vinci Code uh, involving a Harvard professor, a, a one-time Florida pornographer, and an escape from East Germany requires a big leap, leap of faith. Yeah. So, um, the, the short version uh, is this, uh, this gentleman by the name of um, uh, Walter Fritz, uh, is, uh, was tracked down as the owner of the document, the person who gave it to Dr. King, um, and uh, presented himself to Dr. King as basically just a guy who came across some ancient documents and was wondering if they were worth something, um, which is apparently how a lot of these forgeries, uh, at least the good ones, are, are passed off on other people. The interesting thing is they're not often passed off on scholars. They're, they're passed off on dealers or collectors who yep. don't have the tools and the resources to check to see whether this stuff is accurate. So why he gave it to Dr. King is a, is a big mystery, um, although maybe he was uh, attempting to discredit her or the field or something like that, and the article goes into some stories about that. But this guy is, um, well, he's a real interesting character. Uh, he's a, a real interesting character, yeah. He's, yeah. Uh, turns out he sort of has a history of being a con man. He's a, uh, he's a failed Egyptologist. Um, uh, he's a pornographer. Uh, and, and trying to get to the article really does try to figure out, well, you know, was it to discredit Dr. King or the field because he feels his connection to it? You know, kind of a field that he dropped out of and couldn't make it in since yeah. Egyptology is, is next to it. Or uh, the, uh, apparently he, um, he has some... Some very interesting spiritual beliefs. Yes. So there, there's also the theory in in the article. The writer talks about well, you know, maybe he was trying to do a a noble lie. Like yes. you know, he 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 believed this this to be true on on another level. So he tried to pass this off, uh, you know, to to get, you know, so that people would would believe that Jesus had a wife and to have a more feminist Jesus and a right. a, a sexy Jesus because in in this guy's spiritual beliefs apparently. You know, he calls it a Gnostic Jesus. I, I don't know if we'd quite get behind his definition of Gnosticism. Right. But, you know, he's into stuff like sacred sex and, uh, and they marry Jesus. And apparently his wife is, uh, um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, a medium who is in communication with uh, angels and with Jesus and has written a book about her, her insights. Um, so, so, yeah, so was, was he trying to discredit it? Was he trying to to get these uh, these ideas out there because he thinks that they're real on another level. Maybe it's a mix of both. Sure. Um, so all this, you know, the, the actual story uh, is, is, is in some ways more interesting than the fragment, even if the fragment was real. Right. And this isn't to rule out that the fragment, it, it could still be an authentic fourth or whatever century fragment at this point. Yes. Um, it, it, it's almost impossible to tell without him actually confessing that, you know, yes, I created this document. And the, the author of the article um, does believe that he had the skills to recreate this document, at least in the way that, um, that it was done. Um, because this guy apparently had art, uh, art training as well. Yeah, so it's, it's a rather damning article. You don't, you don't read and walk away being like, well, you know what, this is probably an authentic piece, and it's just all coincidence. <laughs> um, you know, although the the writer of the article does not, you know, unequivocally state that either. Right. But you, you'd be hard pressed to to read this 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 piece of journalism and walk away and being like, well, you know, there's a good chance that it's real. Yeah, no, it's, there's a very slim chance that it's real, but I guess there kind of is still a chance. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. There's still, there's still a chance. Strange, stranger things have happened. Um, and again, you know, in what Kerry King has has always said um, is this does this was never proof that Jesus was married, right? Because uh, the papyrus is dated to like the third, fourth, maybe even the fifth century. Mm -hmm. So she's always said that you know this is proof that that some uh, groups of early Christians at least one Jesus individual thought. At least, <laughs> yeah. That's, that's all you can really say about it. Yeah, um, um, and, and, and of course, you know, this is this is not a new idea either by any stretch of the imagination. There are people who are uh, pulling for a married Jesus, you know, for uh, millennia. Yes, although th that said, it is kind of a new idea. I can't really track the um, the Jesus being married thing uh, further than the 1800s. And if someone out there can find any reference, um, it just doesn't, uh, it doesn't really seem to have been in the public imagination or have been believed by groups of Christians mm. or um, um, even as a conspiracy theory or, or as anything. Yeah. It really does seem to come in into the 1800s, and now it seems to be 
really kind of sunk into our subconscious. Yeah. Uh, it, it's really an idea that, that really grabs a lot of people. Yeah, a liberal reading, of course, of the Gospel of Philip would, uh, <laughs> would yes. as Dan Brown did. Uh, Dan Brown in the news also recently for donating, um, was it 30,000 euro or 300,000 euro? I think to, it was 300,000. Yeah, God it, bless him. I know, an ungodly amount of money to the Rittman Library in Amsterdam. for, But that's a whole other story. But anyway, thank you, Dan Brown, for that. I look forward to reading all of those. Uh, yeah. Documents that get digitized. Um, well, that that is that is huge. I mean, you know, yeah. I'm not a big Dan Brown fan, but but to think that he did that, I mean, I am. That, I, I mean, I for for <laughs> for what it's worth, I mean, I yeah. still like his books, you know. Yeah. Um, but anyway, <laughs> yeah. So uh, let's move on to the second article because uh, you know we've we've talked a lot about the first one, but the second article came out yesterday. Uh, was a um, essentially a response from Karen King. Uh, yes. Can you can you give us a quick summary of that one? Yeah, basically, Karen King uh, says um, she uh, she didn't meet with or comment further. I believe uh, on some of the findings in the um, in the the article in the Atlantic Monthly, even when she was asked. Yeah. Um, and then she she kind of uh, did a little follow up yesterday, saying, oh, "Okay, well, now that I've read this article and I and I understand the importance of kind of tracking where this document com- came from, I can come and come to understand that." Uh, that, uh, that there's a good chance this is fake. Mm-hmm. Um, reading the article, I, I would say maybe if you're a layman, Karen King, a lay woman, a lay person, uh, Karen King doesn't come across that great, though it is pretty sympathetic to her. And, uh, you know, we both only met her briefly, but she, she is obviously a, a very warm and understanding person. Mm-hmm. Uh, and her work is very, um, very, very interesting, uh, very important, very relevant, and very brilliant. Um, and, uh, I think unfortunately, uh, you know, that this article will, not, the article is very even handed, but I think yeah. a quick reading of it will unfortunately not reflect well on Dr. King. And of course this whole thing will not reflect well on her work, but I'm bringing this up to, to say, you know, if you read this article, have a little bit of nuance and kind of read what the, what the writer is trying to say about Dr. King and her work. And, uh, and, and just remember how, how brilliant she is. And, you know, she's a tenured professor at, at Harvard and she's published some, some brilliant books and articles over the year and, and I, over the years. And I just hope that this doesn't, uh, besmirch her, her good reputation. No, I, I think her work speaks for itself. On you know, especially her work on uh, on the Sethian texts and everything. So I, I'm, I mean, sure, that's something that could happen. But I, uh, she's um, she's certainly a brilliant scholar and and uh, and one of our favorites here at, yes. at Talknosis. It's it, it does make me sad that this will be you know ninety nine point nine percent of people's uh, first introduction to that's her. true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, what I so found interesting uh, and and. I don't know. The, it was mentioned in the first article, and the second article kind of hammered it home to me. Is it didn't seem to me that she was really at all interested in where the document came from, and I understand that to a certain degree, yeah. Um, because all the scientific tests came back saying authentic fourth-century document, yes. um, even if the linguistic tests were questionable, and and the, oh. you know the whole thing being a bit too. Um, oh, mind if I mind if I interrupt? She does have an argument. It's one that I thought of right away, uh, too. And I'm not near as smart as uh, of her, but the uh, as her, <laughs> the uh, so so the copying from from Gospel of Thomas. This was this was actually quite common in, in the ancient world sure. that, that people would lift whole phrases and, as well as you know perhaps even errors from each other. So mm-hmm. that was basically her argument. It's particularly common back then when scribes you know looked to other documents, looked to different examples, um, and communities borrowed from each other. So there is there is sort of a an argument that for for that sort of thing that seems to be a glaring indictment of the uh, of the text. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. So no, you no, were that's saying, fine. That, yeah. That's a good point. Uh, the the quote that is taken in the second article from her that uh, it's just it seems seems odd to me. But it, the, her she's quoted as saying, "Your article has helped me see that provenance can be investigated." Yes. I I wouldn't have thought that would have been in question. Um, yeah, yeah, it seems quite obvious to us. Um, but again, we are outside of the field. Sure. Um, you have the text, and I, I don't want to read into Doctor Doctor King's motives or other scholars' motives, uh, and so I'm, I'm going to carefully preface this before I say this. But many texts, most texts, the vast majority of these texts do not have a very nice provenance, and they often sure. have. Unsavory people, 
uh, lurking in the background. Absolutely. Uh, so I mean, most, the, most of these are bought on the black market. Most of them are bought on the black market. Most of them come from grave robbers. Yep. Most of them are bought on the black market, and they're illegally exported from. It's usually Egypt, um, mm -hmm. both because Egypt had a lot of these Gnostic and Gnostic -y communities, <laughs> and also because, of course, the dry desert sands protects these these texts. Yeah. So, so basically, they're they're Ill illegally stolen from the people of Egypt, from the government of Egypt. They're usually chopped up. There's usually some con men. There's sometimes violence, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like in the background of the of the Nag Hammadi, right? There's yeah, some absolutely. there's some violence. Uh, people are stealing from each other. Uh, they're making up stories. So, so when you, I think sometimes scholars consciously or subconsciously, you know, they get the text and that's what matters. Right. They do the test on it and maybe they don't want to look too much into the background. And sure. of course maybe they should and maybe they should be asking the hard questions. Now I'm not saying that's what why you know, I'm not saying that was a motivation of Dr. King. No. But I think it's it's definitely there. It's I I you know, I'd say it's probably a motivation of some scholars and if it's not it's it's at least lurking in the background. Yeah. Yeah. But well, it is obvious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We should find out where these texts came from. Well, all right, there's so much we can say about this, but let's wrap things up here for now um, just to, uh, you know, uh, make a nice, neat package of this. And then, you know, please discuss this in the comments. Um, there's a ton of stuff to talk about still uh, about this. And I hope that we can uh, get the, uh, the author of the article, um, Ariel Sabar, Sabar, I don't know how to say his name, but, um, you know, hopefully we can get him on and hopefully we could also get uh, Dr. King on at some point uh, in the near future to discuss all of these things. And, and again, all of her excellent work and scholarship in the field. I have, I, I've already, I've already uh, emailed the journalist. I have a feeling Dr. King's going to be pretty busy with uh, media requests <laughs> for <laughs> the next, yep. next little while. But uh, and also, interestingly enough, the, the writer of, of this uh, of this article, is, is, uh, his father is a Hebrew professor, so he does, you know, he sort of he has one push in that world, or he has connections to it. So right, so. right. Okay. Uh, yes, so we, we will talk about it further. All right, fantastic. So thank you everybody for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. This has been a production of the Gnostic Wisdom Network. For more information about this and all of GWN's programming, please visit GnosticWisdom.net. The opinions expressed in the show do not necessarily reflect the opinions of GWN, the Apostolic Joannite Church, or any other organization. This has been released under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 4.0 International License and is brought to you by the generous support of our patrons. To support our programs and become a patron, please visit patreon.com slash gnostic. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash g-n-o-s-t-i-c.